Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Zor Olympia Zorba Music Hall for the Saturday night main event of Lowell Celebrates Kerouac. Let's give yourselves a big hand for getting here, for coming from far and wide. We have an international assemblage here tonight. I'm very proud to say it's my hometown, Lowell, Massachusetts, and uh, I'm a member of the, the Lowell Celebrates Kerouac group. It's, it's such a wonderful thing to have everybody coming into Lowell. Uh, this is the 30th uh, anniversary of the dedication of the Kerouac commemorative, the 60th anniversary of the publication of Dharma Bums. And uh, it's great to see the appreciation of the life and work of Jack Kerouac growing and to see that, that growth represented in the, the fantastic attendance that we get at these events every year. It's such a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm very humbled to be part of it. And uh, I want to thank you all for, for coming out again uh, you know, to, to celebrate Kerouac with us here in Lowell again. So give yourselves a big hand for that. I want to thank our hosts again, Olympia Zorba Music Hall. We were here last night. We are here again tonight. These guys are fantastic. Please take care of your waitresses, bartenders. I got to thank all of our sponsors, including the uh, Enterprise Bank and the, uh, the uh, Duncan Family Fund that helped uh, underwrite this evening in particular. We have a fantastic musical performer coming on a little bit later. Uh, for some of you who may have been here early, caught the sound check. Vance Gilbert is in the house. He's going to be performing later on. That's going to be an exceptional treat. We're all going to love that. But I am up here now to introduce the act that, uh, that, is, that is about to take place. And the man sitting right here to my right is, is uh, uh, I'm so happy to be sitting next to the man sitting at my right. This is Mr. John Cassidy, ladies and gentlemen, the son of, of the one and only Neil Cassidy. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, some of you, if you were here last night, you may have caught a little bit, uh, a little taste maybe, of, of what we're going to get tonight. But tonight, I'm going to be bringing up to the stage another man, if you were here last night, you're familiar with. If you are into this whole sort of beat world, you're probably familiar with this man. Talking about the guy who's the, the author of the brand new beat trilogy that, is, that, has, uh, that has come to fruition as a trilogy with the publication of his latest book, On the Road with Cassidy's and Further Visions. He's the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to Jack Kerouac and the epic How the Beats begat the pranksters. He is a phenomenal, phenomenal individual. He has got a lot to share and a lot to give, and he's gonna do it tonight. Tonight they are gonna do a thing called Cassidy and Hassett present Cassidy and Kerouac. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Hassett and John Cassidy, give him a big hand for Lowell Celebrates Kerouac. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna be bringing Jack and Neil into the house. Uh, we're gonna use Jack's words and Neil's offspring. <laughs> and uh, you're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna rock this thing. <laughs> so here is uh, On the Road, coming to life like uh, it's ever come to life before. All right, so I'll be in the role of Jack and son brother John will be in the role of Pops Neil, and uh, so here was one of the uh, many adventures they had when they were driving north. And for the first time, we were alone and could talk about anything we wanted. And Neil grabbed the wheel, shifted to second, mused a minute, rolling, and suddenly decided something and shot the car full jet down the road in a fury of decision. All right now, children, he said, rubbing his nose and bending down to feel the emergency and pulling cigarettes out of the compartment and swaying back and forth as he did these things and drove. The time has come for us to decide what we're going to do for the next week. Crucial, crucial. Uh -huh. And he dodged a mule wagon and in it sat an old man plodding along. Yes, yelled Neil. Dig him. Now consider his soul. Stop a while and consider. Hmm. And he slowed down the car for all of us to turn and look at the old jazz bow moaning along. Oh yes, dig him sweet. Now there's thoughts in that mind that I would give my last arm to know. To climb in there and find out just what he's poor ass pondering about this year's turnip greens and ham. Jack, you don't know it, but I once lived with a farmer in Arkansas for a while, uh, for a whole year, and when I was 11. I had awful chores. I had to skin a dead horse once. Ugh. Um, haven't been to Arkansas since Christmas 1943, five years ago, when Ben, Gavin, and I 
were chased by a man with a gun who owned the car we were trying to steal. <laughs> Sounds like dad. Um, <laughs> I, I say all this to show you that of the South, I can speak. I have known, I mean, man, I dig the South. I know it in and out. I've dug your letters to me about it, and oh yes, oh yes. He said, trailing off and then stopping altogether, and then suddenly jumping the car back to 70 and hunching over the wheel, and he stared doggedly ahead. Mary Lou was smiling serenely. This was the new and complete Neil, grown to maturity. And I said to myself, my God, he's changed. Fury spat out of his eyes when he told of things he hated, and great glows of joy replaced this when he suddenly got happy, and every muscle twitched to live and go. Oh man, the things I could tell you. He said, poking me. Oh man, we must absolutely find the time. What has happened to Alan? We all, we all get to see Alan, darlings, first thing tomorrow. Now, Mary Lou, we're getting some bread and meat to make lunch for New York. How much money do you have, Jack? <laughs> we'll put everything in the back seat, this is Kate's furniture, and all of us will sit up front, cuddly and close, and tell stories as we zoom to New York. Mary Lou, honey, dies. <clears throat> you sit next to me, Jack next, then Al at the window. Big Al to cut off the drafts, uh, whereby he comes into using the robe this time. And then we'll go off to sweet life, because now is the time, and we all know time. And he rubbed his jaw furiously, and he swung the car and passed three trucks, and he roared into downtown Testament, looking in every direction and seeing everything in an arc of 180 degrees around his eyeballs without moving his head. Bang! He found a parking space in no time, and we were parked. And he leaped out of the car. Furiously, he hustled into the railroad station, and we followed sheepishly. And he bought cigarettes, and. He became absolutely mad in his movements. And he seemed to be doing everything at the same time. It was shaking of the head up and down and sideways and jerky and vigorous hands and quick walking and sitting, crossing his legs, uncrossing, getting up, rubbing his hands, rubbing his fly, hitching his pants, looking up and saying, hmm. And with a sudden slitting of the eyes to see everywhere. And all the time he was grabbing me by the ribs and talking, talking, talking. And it was cold in testament and they had this unseasonable snow and neil stood in the long bleak main street that runs along the railroad clad in nothing but a t-shirt and low-hanging pants with the belt unbuckled as though he was about to take them off and he kept sticking his head in to talk to mary lou and then backing away and fluttering his hands before her oh yes i know you i know you darling his laugh was maniacal, and it started low and ended high, exactly like the laugh of a radio maniac. And then he kept reverting to business-like tones. There was no purpose in our coming downtown, but he found purposes. And he made us all hustle. Mary Lou for groceries, me for a newspaper to dig the weather report, and Al for cigars. Neil loved to smoke his cigars. And he smoked one over the paper and talked. Our, our holy American slop jaws in Washington are planning further inconven inconveniences. Ahem, ah, uh, up, up. And he leaped up and rushed off, rushed off to see a colored girl that had just passed outside the station. <laughs> so he dig her. He said, standing with limp finger pointed, fingering himself with a goofy smile. The little gone black lovely, ah, hmm. And then we got back in the car and flew back to my sister's house. I'd been spending a quiet Christmas in the country, and I realized when I got back to the house and saw the Christmas tree and presents and smelled the roasting turkey and listened to the talk of the relatives. But now the bug was on me again, and the bug's name was Neil Cassidy. And I was off on another spurt on the road. So, now let's take a trip to New Orleans. That was a favorite place they went. There's the three great cities in America that are on the coast that bring in the new influences from outside the country. New York City, San Francisco, and New Orleans. 
And I love down there, if you go down there, they sometimes referred to as the United States of New Orleans, because it's its own world. And of course, Jack and, Jack and Neil found that and made it theirs. So here they are heading in that direction. I drove through South Carolina and beyond Macon, Georgia, as Neil, Mary Lou, and Al slept. All alone in the night, I had my own thoughts and held the car to the white line in the holy road. What was I doing? Where was I going? I'd soon find out. And I got dog tired beyond Macon and woke up Neil to resume. And he got out of the car for fresh air and suddenly both of us were stoned uh, with joy to realize that in the darkness all around us was fragrant green grass hmm. and the smell of warm waters. We're in the south. We've left the winter. And faint daybreak illuminated green shoots by the side of the road. I took a deep breath a locomotive howled across in the darkness. I took off my shirt and exulted. Ten miles down the road, Neil drove into a filling station with the motor off and noticed the attendant was fast asleep at the desk, jumped out, quickly filled the gas tank, saw to it the bell didn't ring, and rolled off with a five-dollar tank full of gas for our pilgrimage. Back when a tank of gas was five dollars. I slept and woke up in the crazy exultant sounds of music and Neil and Mary Lou talking and the great green land rolling by. Where are we? We just passed the tip of Florida, man. Flomation it's called. Florida? We were rolling down the coastal plain and up ahead were great soaring clouds of the Gulf of Mexico. It was only 32 hours since we'd said goodbye to everybody in the dirty snows of the north. And we stopped at a gas station, and there, Neil and Mary Lou played piggy bank around the tanks, and Hinkle went inside and stole three packs of cigarettes without even trying. And rolling into Mobile over the long tidal highway, we all took off our winter clothes and enjoyed the southern temperature. This was when Neil started telling his life story. And when, beyond Mobile, he came upon, we, he came across a, an obstruction of wrangled cars at a crossroads. And instead of slipping around them, he just bawled right through the driveway of a gas station and right on without relaxing his steady Continental 70. And we left gapped faces behind us and he went right on with his tail. I tell you, it's true. I started at nine with a girl called Millie Mayfair <laughs> in the back of Broad's Garage on Grant Street. Same street Alan lived on in Denver. That's when my father was still barbering a bit. I remember my aunt yelling out the window, what are you doing down there in the back of the garage? Oh, honey, Mary Lou, if I'd only known you then, wow, how sweet you must have been at nine. <laughs> at nine? Cassidy legend lives. <laughs> I didn't start till 10. So. <laughs> but you lived it. <laughs> uh, he tittered maniacally. And he stuck his finger in her mouth and licked it. And took her hand and rubbed it all over himself. And she just sat there smiling serenely. And big long Al Hinkle sat looking out the window talking to himself. Yes sir, I was a ghost that night. And he was also wondering what Helen was going to say to him in New Orleans. <laughs> but Neil went on. One time I rode a freight from New Mexico clear to L.A. I was 11 years old. Lost my father at a sighting. We were all in a hobo jungle. I was with a man called Big Red. My father was out drunk in a boxcar, and it started to roll. Big Red and I missed it. I didn't see my father for months. I rode a long freight all the way to California, really flying, first class freight, a desert zipper. All the way I rode over the couplings. You can imagine how dangerous. I was only a kid, I didn't know, clutching a loaf of bread under one arm and the other hooked around the brake bar. This is no story, this is true. When I got to LA, I was so starved for milk and cream, I got a job in a dairy 
The first thing I did, I drank two quarts of heavy cream and puked. <laughs> Poor Neil, said Mary Lou, and she kissed him. And he stared straight, a straight ahead proudly. He loved her. And we were suddenly driving along the blue waters of the Gulf. And at the same time, a momentous mad thing began on the radio. It was the chicken jazz and gumbo disc talkie show from New Orleans. And all the mad jazz records and colored records and the disc jockey saying, don't worry about nothing. And we got to New Orleans in the night ahead of us with joy. Neil rubbing his hands over the wheel. Now we're going to get our kicks. Uh-huh. And at dusk, we were coming into the humming streets of New Orleans. Oh, smell the people. Yelled Neil with his face out the window, sniffing. Oh, God, life. And we swung around a trolley. Yes. And he darted the car and looked in every direction for girls. Look at her. <laughs> the air was so sweet in New Orleans, it seemed to come in soft bandanas. And you could smell the river and really smell the people and mud and molasses and every kind of tropical exaltation with your nose suddenly removed from the dry ices of a northern winter. And we bounced in our seats. And dig her, yelled De Neil, pointing to another woman. Oh, I love, love, love women. I think women are wonderful. I live for women. He groaned and he clutched his head and great beads of sweat fell from his forehead from pure excitement and exhaustion. And we bounced the car up along the Algiers Ferry and found ourselves crossing the Mississippi River by boat. Now we must all get out and dig the river and the people and smell the world, said Neil, bustling with his sunglasses and cigarettes and leaping out of the car like a jack-in-the-box. And we followed. On rails we leaned and looked at the great brown father of waters rolling down from mid-America like a torrent of broken souls bearing Montana logs and Dakota mud and things that had drowned in three forks where the secret began in ice. And smoky New Orleans receded on one side and Old sleepy Algiers with its warped wood sides bumped us on the other. And men were working in the hot afternoon, stoking the fairy furnaces that burned red below deck, making our tires smell. Neil dug them, and hopping up and down in the heat, we rushed around the deck and upstairs in his baggy pants, halfway down his belly, and suddenly saw, I saw him eagering on the flying bridge. I expected him to take off on wings, and I heard his mad laugh all over the boat. <laughs> and Mary Lou was with them, and he covered everything in a jiffy, and came back with the full story, and jumped in the car just as everybody was tooting to go, and we slipped off, passing two or three cars in a narrow space, and found ourselves darting through Algiers for William Burroughs' house. Which way? Where? On the road. <laughs> All right. So here was it. Some of you uh, in this house, in this room, have ever been to San Francisco. You might have gone by Russell Street and the old house. What was it, 29 Russell, I That's think? That's correct. Uh, where uh, our, my stage partner was conceived and the first house he ever knew in the world and is featured prominently in On the Road and Jack came back and uh, did revisions of uh, versions of On the Road after he wrote it and, and visions of Cody he wrote up in the attic and anybody that knows well On the Road this book features I mean this house on Russell Street features prominently in it so here's a little bit from that when they uh, if you remember when Jack uh, just got back there and Jack and Neil get out, run out on the town and <clears throat> come home with a hooker. And this isn't quite to Carolyn's uh, loving. And uh, so she tosses the two of them out. So this is uh, when Jack and Neil have been kicked out of the house on Russell Street and find themselves on the streets of San Francisco. So we struggled down the street to find the nearest cable car. A mass of men and suitcases with that enormous bandaged thumb sticking up in the air. <laughs> 
That thumb became a symbol of Neil's final development. He no longer cared about anything as before, but now he also cared about everything in principle. That is to say, all, everything was all the same to him and he belonged to the world and there was nothing he could do about it. And he stopped me in the middle of the street. Now man, I know you're probably real bugged. You just got to town and we get thrown out the first day. And you're wondering what I've done to deserve this and so on. Together with all the horrible accessories, he he he. But look at me, please Jack, look at me. Um, <laughs> and I did, I looked at him and he was wearing a t-shirt, torn pants hanging down his belly, tattered shoes, he'd not shaved, his hair was wild and bushy and you know, your mom told me about one thing about these guys, Jack and Neil and all of us who live in some echo of them throughout history, one thing about those two guys that most people don't know is they each always had a comb in their pocket every day, every hour of every day. And every picture you look at it, those two guys, except the one when Gregory messed up his hair when he got down from Desolation Peak, their hair is perfectly combed no matter what they're doing or what state they're in. And so when, when, when Jack describes them as having his hair not combed, it's because it's all, those two were meticulous about their hair care. Yeah, it was true. Um, tattered shoes, his, and his hair was wild and bushy his eyes bloodshot, and that tremendous bandaged thumb stood supported in mid-air at heart level, and on his face was the goofiest grin I ever saw. And he stumbled around in a circle, and we looked everywhere. What do my eyeballs see? Ah, the blue sky, Longfellow. And he swayed, and he blinked, and he rubbed his eyes, and... Together with windows. Have you ever dug windows? Now let's talk about windows. I have seen some really crazy windows that made faces at me. And some of them had shades drawn, and so they winked. Hmm. And out of his sea bag, he fished a copy of Eugene Sue's Mysteries of Paris. And adjusting the front of his t-shirt, <clears throat> he began reading on the street corner with a pedantic air. Now really, Jack, let's dig everything as we go along. And he forgot about that in an instant and looked around blankly. I was glad I had come. He needed me now. So I asked, why did Carolyn throw you out? What are you going to do? Eh? 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 Huh? <laughs> we racked our brains for where we'd go and what we'd do. And I realized it was up to me. Poor, poor Neil. The devil himself had never fallen further. In idiocy with infected thumb, surrounded by the battered suitcases of his motherless, feverish life across America and back numerous times, an undone bird. Let's walk to New York, he said. And as we do, let's take stock of everything along the way. Yes. That's a Cassidyism. <laughs> <sighs> I took out my money and showed it to him. I have here the sum of $83 and change. And if you come with me, let's go to New York. And then after that, let's go to Italy. Italy? He said his eyes lit up. Italy, yes. How shall we get there, dear Jack? Well, I'll make some money. I'll get like $1,000 from the publishers. And we'll all go dig the crazy women in Rome and Paris and all those places. And we'll sit at sidewalk cafes. Why not? Let's go to Italy. Why, yes, said Neil, and then he realized I was serious. <laughs> and he looked at me out of the corner of his eye for the first time. For I've never committed myself before with regard to his burdensome existence. And that look was the look of a man weighing his chances at the last moment before a bet. There were triumph and insolence in his eyes, a devilish look. And he never took his eyes off mine for a long time. And I looked back at him and blushed. I said, what's the matter? I felt wretched when I asked it, because he made no answer, but continued looking at me with the same wary, insolent side eye. 
And I tried to remember everything he'd done in his life. And if there wasn't something back there to make him suspicious of something now. Resolutely and firmly, I repeated what I'd said. Come to New York with me, man. I've got the money. And I looked at him. And my eyes were watering with embarrassment and tears. And still he stared at me. And now his eyes were looking through me. It was probably the pivotal point of our friendship when he realized I had actually spent some hours thinking of him and his troubles. And he was trying to place that in his tremendously involved and tormented mental categories. And something clicked between both of us. And in me, it had been a sudden concern for a man who was years younger than me, he was five years younger, and whose fate was wound with mine across the passage of recent years. And in him, it was a matter that I can ascertain only from what he did afterwards, because he became extremely joyful and said, Everything is settled. But, okay, but what was that look, I asked. And he was pained to hear me say that. And he frowned. It was rare that Neil frowned. And we both felt perplexed and uncertain of something. And we were standing on top of a hill on a beautiful sunny day in San Francisco, and our shadows fell across the sidewalk. And gulls flew overhead in the sparkling air. Well, said Neil in a very shy and sweet voice. Shall we go? Yes, let's go to Italy. And so we picked up our bags, he the trunk with his one good arm, and I the rest, and we staggered to the cable car stop. And in a moment, rolled down the hill with our legs dangling to the sidewalk from the jiggling shelf, two broken down heroes of the Western night. So uh, when my mother Carolyn was still around, obviously, um, <laughs> This is 20 years ago, but uh, she was always doing these kind of speaking conferences, things that they had invited her to. And one of them was in San Francisco. And so my sister, older sister Jamie, and I drove her up uh, to this thing in the city. And um, when it was through, you know, it was only a couple hours or something. And she goes, well, what do you want to do now? And uh, I said, let's go by 29 Russell Street, you know, where I was conceived, if you will. And uh, she goes, great idea. Well, still there, it looked exactly the same. And um, we're kind of poking around, you know. She goes, well, there's the you know, alley where we kept the garbage cans or whatever. And the door opens a crack, and this old guy looks out, and he goes, you know, can I help you? And she explains she used to live there, you know, and, um, in the 40s and blah, blah, at uh, 50s, whatever. And uh, so he goes, do you want to come in and look around, you know? And she, <laughs> we're all, yeah, I think. And so... The first thing in the hallway when you come in the front door is this stuff, it's kind of a day bed, you know? And uh, this was pretty out of character, at least for us, because she was pretty conservative about, you know, her language and everything. I mean, she wasn't straight, but, you know. And, she, and the same day bed was there when, when she was living there in 1950 or whatever. And she goes, hey, that's where I did Jack. <laughs> And I'm all, Mom, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So we, we just laughed. It was pretty pretty good. It was out of character for her, you know. And I'm going, hey, that, that should be in the Smithsonian, Mom, you know, come on. <laughs> Jeez, you know, or at least sell it on eBay or Amazon or something. And, um, and just to wind it up, this, this old guy pretended like he didn't know who she was or anything about the past or beats or anything like that. And, uh, but he did have the blueprints that he found somewhere of the whole, you know, because she designed half of the place in the garden and blah, blah. And so I'm kind of, you know, nosing around as I want to do. And this den kind of door uh, was ajar, you know, and I look in there, walls of beat books. Like, oh, yeah, he didn't know where he was living, right? <laughs> I didn't call him on it. But I came out, I'm just going, yeah, sure, pal. You had never heard of these guys, right? I mean, he had every book on the planet. Anyway, thank you. The only thing to do was go. And Neil leaped up and said, we were ready to go back to Virginia. And he took a shower, and I cooked up a big platter of rice with all that was left in the house, and Mary Lou sewed his socks, and we were ready to go. And Neil and Alan and I, 
zoomed into New York. And we promised to see Alan in 30 hours, in time for New Year's Eve. It was night. We left him in Times Square and went back through the expensive tunnel into New Jersey and on the road. Taking turns at the wheel, Neil and I made Virginia in 10 hours. Now this is the first time we've been alone and in a position to talk for years, said Neil. And talk we did all night long. As in a dream, we were zooming back through the sleeping Washington, D.C. and back into Virginia wilds, crossing the Appomattox River at daybreak, pulling up at my sister's door at 8 a.m. And all this time, Neil was tremendously excited about everything he saw, every detail of every moment that passed. He was out of his mind with real belief. And of course now, no one can tell us that there is no God. We've passed through all forms. Remember, Jack, when I first came to New York, I wanted Chad Kinning to teach me about Nietzsche. You see how long ago? Everything is fine. God exists. We know time. Everything since the Greeks has been predicted wrong. You can't make it with geometry and geometrical systems of thinking. It's all this. And he wrapped his finger in his fist, and the car still hugging the line straight and true. And not only that, but we both understand that I couldn't have time to explain why I know, and you know, God exists. And at one point, I moaned about life's troubles, and how my, poor my family was, and how much I wanted to help Lucille, who was also poor and had a daughter. Troubles, you see, is the generalization word for what God exists. Uh, and the thing is not to get hung up. Uh, my head rings. He cried, clasping his head. And he rushed out of the car like Groucho Marx to get cigarettes. That furious ground-hugging walk with the coattails flying, except, of course, Neil had no coattails. Since Denver, Jack, a lot of things, oh, the things I've thought and thought. I used to be in reform school all the time. I was a young punk asserting myself, stealing cars, psychological expression of my position. All my jail problems are pretty straight now. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, I shall never be in jail again. The rest is not my fault. Yeah, we wish. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't know that bit. <laughs> we passed a little kid who was throwing stones at the cars in the road. One day he'll put a stone through a man's windshield and the man will crash and die. All on account of that little kid. You see what I mean? God exists without qualms. As we roll along this way, I am positive beyond doubt that everything will be taken care of for us. That even you, as you drive, Fearful of the wheel. I hated to drive and drove very carefully. The thing will go along of itself and you won't go off the road and I can sleep. Furthermore, we know America, we're at home. I can go anywhere in America and get what I want because it's the same in every corner. I know the people, I know what, to, what they do. We give and take and go in the incredibly complicated sweetness zigzagging every side. There was nothing clear about the things he said. <laughs> but what he meant to say was somehow made pure and clear. And he used the word pure a great deal. I had never dreamed Neil would become a mystic. These were the first days of his mysticism, which would lead to the strange, ragged, W.C. Field saintliness of his later days. And even my mother listened to him with a curious half-ear as we roared back north to New York that same night with the furniture in the back. Now my mum was in the car, and Neil settled down and talking about his work life in San Francisco. And we went over every single detail of what a brake man has to do, demonstrating every time we passed yards and at one point, he even jumped out of the car to show me how a brakeman gives the high sign through the rain. And the mayor retired to the back seat and went to sleep. And in Washington at 4 a.m., Neil again called Carolyn Collect in Frisco. And shortly after this, as we pulled out of Washington, a cruising car overtook us with siren going. And we had a speeding ticket, in spite of the fact we were going about 30. 
It was the California license plate that did it. You fellas think you can rush through here as fast as you want just because you come from California? Said the cop. And I went with Neil to the sergeant's desk and we tried to explain to the police that we had no money. And they said Neil would have to spend the night in jail if we didn't round up the money. And of course my mother had it, $15. We had 20 at all. And it was going to be just fine. But... And in fact, while we were arguing with the cops, one of them went out to peek on my mom who sat wrapped in the, back of, uh, in the back of the car. And she saw him and told him, don't worry, I'm not a gun mall. If you want to come and search the car, you go right ahead. I'm going home with my son. And this furniture isn't stolen, it's my daughter's. She just had a baby and we're moving to her new house. And this flabbergasted the old Sherlock. And he went back into the station house and my mother had to pay the fine for Neil, or we'd be stuck in Washington, because I had no license, of course. And Neil promised to pay it back, and he actually did, exactly a year and a half later, and to my mother's pleased surprise. My mom, a respectable woman, hung up in this sad world, and, well, she knows this world. And she told us about the cop. He was hiding behind the tree, trying to see what I looked like. I told him to search the car if he wanted. I have nothing to be ashamed of. Neil had something to be ashamed of, and me too by virtue of being with him. My mother once said, the world will never find peace until men fell at their women's feet and asked for forgiveness. <laughs> and Neil knew this, and he mentioned it many times. I pleaded and pleaded with Mary Lou for a peaceful, sweet understanding of pure love between us forever, with all the hassles thrown out. She's, she understands. Her mind is bent on something else. She's after me. She won't understand how much I love her. She's knitting my doom. The truth of the matter is, we don't understand our women. We blame them, and it's all our fault. But it isn't as simple as all that, warned Neil. Peace will come suddenly, and we won't understand it when it does. Neil and Jack on the road. <laughs> this is um, from uh, the Chicago jazz part of On the Road. And so there's actually three versions of this, and I've merged the three of them into one. Um, he, they talk about this in On the Road, the going to sh Chicago and going to catch the jazz. But then Jack also had an excerpt of this published in, I think, 1955 in like uh, the Evergreen Review or something like that, which was a slightly different version than what actually ended up in the book. And he recorded this. This was a neat story. Um, you know, they were making audio tapes back then. They were recording themselves on um, little reel-to-reels. And uh, so he had recorded this and had it in uh, the files when he died, and the, and the tape was labeled Charlie Parker. So Stella and his family and everybody thought this was like a tape he made of Charlie Parker's recordings. And so, okay, well, that's a Charlie Parker thing. Well, we don't need to hear that. Turns out it's him writing about Charlie Parker. Or him, and him reading the piece that he had written in, in 1955, but then he improvises off of it. So it's actually the, the audio recording, which was then released in, I don't know, 1999 or something, as um, uh, Jack Kerouac reads On the Road, and it's like a 30-minute excerpt. It's maybe the best audio Jack, other than Pull My Daisy, that you can hear anywhere. Um, and it's that version. And this Chicago thing is in the middle of it. But he improvises off of it and throws in little details and stuff that he's just doing on the spot. So I've taken all three versions and mer merged them into a master... Chicago jazz piece, and that's what this is. Great Chicago glowed red before our eyes. We were suddenly on Madison Street among hordes of hobos, and some of them sprawled out on the street with their feet on the curb, and hundreds of others milling in the doorways of saloons and alleys. Whoop, whoop, look sharp for old Neil Cassidy there. 
He may be in Chicago by accident this year. And we let out the hobos on this street and proceeded to downtown Chicago. Screeching trolleys, newsboys, gals cutting by, the smell of fried food and beer in the air, neons winking everywhere. We're in the big town, Jack. Hoo-wee. And first thing we did was park the Cadillac in a good dark spot and wash up and dress for the night. And across the street from the YMCA, we found a red brick alley between the buildings where we stashed the Cadillac with her snout pointing out to the street and ready to go. And then we followed the college boys up to the Y where they got a room and allowed us to use the facilities for an hour. And Neil and I shaved and showered and I dropped my wallet in the hall and Neil found it and was about to sneak it in his shirt when he realized it was ours. And he was right disappointed. Score, almost. <laughs> and we said goodbye to the boys, who were glad they'd made it in one piece. And we took off to eat in a cafeteria. Old brown Chicago with strange semi-eastern, semi-western types going to work. And Neil stood in the cafeteria, rubbing his belly and taking it all in. And we walked to talk to, wanted to talk to some strange middle-aged colored woman who had come into the cafeteria with some story about how she had no money, but she had buns with her. And would they give her butter? And she came in flapping her hips, was turned down, and went out flipping her butt. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yelped Neil. Let's follow her down the street. Let's take her to the old Cadillac in the alley. We'll have a ball. Like, was there any chick in On the Road that he didn't say that about? <laughs> uh, but we forgot that and headed straight for North Clark Street after a spin in the loop to see the hoochie-coochie joints and hear the bop. And what a night it was. Oh, man. Said Neil as we stood in front of the bar. Dig the street life. Chinamen that cut by in Chicago. What a weird town. Well, and that woman in that window up there, just looking down with her big breasts hanging from her nightgown, big wide eyes waiting. Whee! Jack, we got to go and never stop going until we get there. Where are we going, man? I don't know, but we got to go. <laughs> that should be on Neil's tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then here we came, a gang, oh, then here came a gang of young bop musicians carrying their instruments out of cars. And they piled right into the saloon and we followed them. And they set up and started blowing and there we were. The leader was a slender, curly-haired, pursy-mouthed tenor man, thin a shoulder, draped loose in a sports shirt, cool in the warm night who picked up his horn and frowned in it and blew cool and complex and was daintily stamping his feet to catch ideas and ducking to miss others and saying, well, when the other boys took solos. He was the leader, the encourager, the schoolmaker, the Bix, the Louie in the great formal school of new underground subterranean American music that would someday be studied in all all the universities of Europe and the world. And he was right about that, Kerouac was. He called this in 1948, and it's being studied in universities all around the world. And we got a whole university right here in the front row table studying this stuff. Down here from Montreal, welcome the students of the future. Yeah. Very cool. And then there was Prez. A husky, handsome blonde with a freckled boxer, meticulously molded in his sharkskin plaid shirt with a long drape and the collar falling back and the tie undone for exact sharpness and casualness, hitching up his horn and writhing into it, and a tone just like Lester Young himself, blowing round as they all leaned and jammed together, the heroes of the bop generation. You see, man, Perez uh, has the technical anxiety as a, of a money-making musician. He's the only one who's well-dressed, obvious big band employee, 
See him grow worried when he blows a clinker, <laughs> but the leader, that cool cat, tells him not to worry and just blow truth. The mere sound and serious exuberance of the music is all he cares about. He's an artist. He's teaching young Prez the boxer. Now the others dig. And they rolled into a tune, Idaho, I think it was called. And the third sax was on an alto. 18-year-old, cool, contemplative, young Charlie Parker type from high school with a broad gash mouth, taller than the rest, grave, motionless on the horn, fingering, erect, an idealist who reads Homer and Bird, cool, contemplative. And he raises his horn and blows into it quietly and thoughtfully and elicits bird-like phrases and architectural Miles Davis logics. These were the children of the great bop innovators. Because once there was Louis Armstrong blowing his beautiful top in the muds of New Orleans. And before him, the mad tuba players and trombone kings who paraded on official days and broke up their Sousa marches into ragtime. And then came Swing and Roy Eldridge, vigorous and virile, blasting the horn for everything it had in waves of power and logic and subtlety leaning to it with glittering eyes and a lovely smile and sending it out broadcast to rock the jazz world. And then came Charlie Parker, a kid in his mother's woodshed in Kansas City, smoke from stovetops, wool hats, blowing his taped up alto among the logs and practicing on rainy days and coming out to watch the old swinging Basie and Benny Moten band that had Hot Lips Page and the rest. And Charlie Parker, leaving home and coming to Harlem and meeting Mad Monk and Madder Gillespie. Charlie Parker, in the early days when he was flipped and walked around in a circle while playing. Somewhat younger than Lester Young, also from KC, that gloomy, saintly goof in whom the history of jazz was wrapped. For when he held his horn high and horizontal from his mouth, he blew the greatest. And as his hair grew longer and he got lazier and stretched out, his horn came down halfway till it finally fell all the way. And today, as he wears his thick-soled shoes so he can't feel the sidewalks of life, his horn is held weakly against his chest, and he blows cool and easy get-out phrases. Here were the children of the American Bop Night. Oh, yeah. Wow, Jack, what a party! New Year's Eve in New York went on for days. Al Hinkle, Luann, Ginsey, everybody. Even met John Holmes. Oh, that was you. I know, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can switch. Okay, yeah, that, they are kind of interchangeable, those two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was drizzling and mysterious at the beginning of our journey. I could see that it was all going to be one big saga of the mist. Who? Here we go. And he hunched over the wheel and gunder. He was back in his element. Everybody could see that. And we were all delighted, and we all realized we were leaving confusion and nonsense behind and performing our one and noble function of the time. Move. And we moved. And we flashed past the mysterious white signs in the night somewhere in New Jersey that say south and west. And we took the south one, New Orleans. It burned in our brains. From the dirty snows of frosty New York, as Neil called it, all the way to the greeneries and river smells of old New Orleans at the washed out bottom of America, and then west. Al was in the back seat, and Mary Lou and Neil and I sat in the front and had the warmest talk about the goodness and joy of life. And Neil suddenly became tender. Now, damn it, look here, all of you. 
We all must admit that everything is fine and there's no need in the world to worry. And in fact, we should realize what it would mean to us to understand that we're not really worried about anything. Am I right? We all agreed. Here we go. We're all together. What did we do in New York? Let's forgive. We all had our spats back there. That's behind us, merely by miles and inclinations. Now we're headed down to New Orleans to dig old Bill Burroughs, and ain't that going to be kicks? And listen, will you, to this old tenor man blow his top. And he shot up the radio volume till the car shuddered. And listen to him tell the story and put down true relaxation and knowledge. We all jumped to the music and agreed. The purity of the road, man. The white line in the middle of the highway unrolled and hugged our left tire as if glued to our groove. And Neil hunched his muscular neck, t-shirted in the winter night, and blasted the car along. And he insisted, I drive through Baltimore for traffic practice. And I was all right, uh, except he and Mary Lou insisted on steering while they kissed and fooled around. It was crazy. And the radio was on full blast, and Neil beat drums on the dashboard till a great big sag developed in it. And I did too, and man, that poor Hudson, the slow boat to China, was receiving her beating. Oh man, what kicks. Now, Mary Lou, listen, really, honey, you know that I'm hot rock capable of everything at the same time, and I have unlimited ener energy. Now, in San Francisco, you must go on living together. I know just the right place for you at the end of a regular chain gang run. I'll be home just a cut hair less than every two days and for 12 hours at a stretch. And man, you know what we can do for 12 hours, darling. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'll go right on living at Carolyn's like nothing. See, she won't know. We can work it. We've done it before. <laughs> Rascal. Uh, and Neil. Neil, like, oh yeah, that's... That's another one of the things, you know, Carolyn talks about this, that she found out what her husband was up to by reading her pal Jack's book. <laughs> and I'm sure this was one of the little details he wasn't aware of. <laughs> um, it was all right with Mary Lou. She was really out for Carolyn's scalp. The understanding had been that Mary Lou would switch to me in Frisco, but I now began to see they were going to stick, and I was going to be left alone on my butt on the other end of the continent. But why think about that? Now, when all the golden lands ahead of you, all of the LCK weekend is ahead of all of us, and all sorts of unforeseen events wait lurking to surprise us and make you glad you're alive to see him. Jack Kerouac and On the Road. It's a little story, it will explain itself, my favorite story of uh, John Cassidy and his dad. Neil's wheel karma was not limited to automobiles, trains, nor chariots in ancient Rome in a past life. A friend of mine, George, who was about my age and lived down at the end of our street, owned his very own go-kart. He wasn't really one of the gang on Bancroft Avenue, but that go-kart made him the envy of the neighborhood, in spite of its missing an engine, <laughs> usually a critical component on a cart. When, excuse me, when we could talk George into loaning it to us, my friends and I would laboriously drag the thing up the steepest hills we could find around the area, and there were plenty in Montesorino, nestled as it is in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Occasionally, we'd even let George come along. <laughs> He wasn't a bad sort, but was probably not accepted into our group of guys wholeheartedly because he was kind of a mama's boy, went to a private school, and he was fat. <laughs> Kids can be so cruel. We sure loved this go-kart, though. Two of us would grab the front of the frame and trudge up a hill, usually a steep driveway, because there were lots of long ones going up to million-dollar homes in the hills, and they were safer than the street. The cart had brakes, but the rider was obliged to see how fast he could go before applying them, like playing <laughs> chicken with the bottom of the hill. The driveway is emptied into a street, of course, so 
we would post lookouts at the bottom to yell cars if one was approaching, uh, a car if one was approaching. Then the driver would have to stand on the brakes or veer off into the adjoining orchards. You were considered a real daredevil if you ignored the brake pedal altogether and flew through the wall of bushes across the road and into the creek. And many a summer afternoon was spent in this pursuit. One night at the dinner, dinner table, I was regaling Dad about our adventures with George's motorless go-kart, and his face lit up. Can I try it? <laughs> he said as if he were my own age, around 12 at the time, I think. Um, sure, Dad, I stammered, caught off guard. He was working at the local Goodyear shop, the last Gattis tire company at the time, as a tire recap, a recapper to support the family and, set aside, and to satisfy the parole board. <laughs> uh, the next day, however, was Saturday, and we could hardly wait to go down to George's house. An only child, George and his parents were often mysteriously not at home, on which occasions my buddies and I would uh, borrow the cart without permission, as they never locked the garage door. <laughs> we always seemed to, I think I got, it's in the blood somewhere from someone that I, uh, anyway. We always seemed to get it back in the garage before they return, as I recall. This particular Saturday morning, there was again no one home. So sim uh, Neil simply said, well, maybe another time. Well, I managed to convince him that we had a standing invitation to borrow the cart in George's absence, a, cleat, a complete and utter fabrication. And in spite of his serious misgivings, we decided to roll it out of the garage for just one quick little spin. The driveway right next door to George's was plenty steep, but better yet, it had a hairpin turn at the bottom, which if taken at just the right angle, one could make without using the brakes at all and without flipping the thing into the ditch, this continuing down the street all the way to the cul-de-sac at the end of Bancroft Avenue. I'll never forget the sight of Dad squeezed in, into the seat, his knees and elbows sticking way out either side all akimbo, grinning from ear to ear, yelling, whoa, whoop, whoa, hey, as he slid around the turn in a four-wheel drift and a cloud of dirt and gravel. Soon all the kids in the neighborhood lined the course, cheering and laughing as this grown-up flew down the course again and again, attempting to better his time. We were having so much fun, of course, that we lost track of time. Then it happened. George's father's car came into view up the street, and the kids scattered as if a skunk had fallen from the sky into their midst. As the car approached, George and family had expressions of stark horror on their faces. <laughs> Could it be that we had not only stolen George's beloved go-kart, but also that an adult condoned such behavior and was even an accomplice to the crime? I looked up at Dad woefully, and he <laughs> definitely had the look of the kid caught with his hand in the proverbial cookie jar. The parents stopped the car at the foot of the driveway and got out, flustered. George stayed in the back seat, but leaned out the car window, not wanting to miss a thing. This should be good, he seemed to say to himself. George said, um, I could show my dad his go-kart. I blurted out without thinking, purely by kid instinct. I did not, yelled George from the window. Did too, did not, and so on. So this is your father, the mother began. <laughs> of all things, a grown man. She said this more than once. What kind of an example are you setting? Neil was bowing his head and shuffling his feet in the gravel uncomfortably, <laughs> saying things like, yes, well, you see, the boy here, that is to say, um, you know, like he's, he's going, these kids, you know, what are you going to do? Um, uh, and not really offering much in the way of an excuse. It was quite embarrassing for him, I imagine. The mother was pretty indignant, but I saw I caught the old man smiling behind her back, stifling a laugh. She finally, she finally ran out of steam, much to our relief, and asked sarcastically if we wouldn't mind taking the cart back up to the garage. Dad walked home a few steps ahead of me at a quick pace, probably to hide his displeasure 
and I felt absolutely full of regret and remorse. He never said an unkind word about the incident or, or anything else for, to me for that matter, but although he must have known I lied about our alleged carte blanche with regard to items in George's garage, I'm sure he pointed out the lesson to me to be learned in a positive way, which is always his want, but I don't recall a lecture. Instead, by the time we got home and he had cooled off a bit, he laughed with glee and gave me a knowing wink. Thanks, son. That was fun. <laughs> Thank you. John Allen Cassidy, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it.